I'm good job. Ong Je vous remercie, Monsieur le Président. Nous nous étions quittés avant la pause déjeuner sur la question des, des nectars et des systèmes de protection qui étaient mis en place, le bouddhisme et puis les liens avec um, des personnes influentes que vous décrivez en quelque sorte le, le site de patronage. Je voulais savoir si ce système de patronage, de lien, de dépendance avec des personnes influentes qui vous offrent une protection était en vigueur dans les villages avant les Khmer Rouges, pour simplifier. Thank you, Madame Civil Party Assembly Lawyer. The quick answer is yes. Uh, before, during, and after, though, as I stressed before, things do change over time, depending on the historical moment. Um, but these sort of centralized, uh, personalized relationship, that structure, which is found in different parts of the world, though it's always localized in different ways, uh, was definitely operative in Cambodia. Uh, then, as it is now today. Dans quelle mesure? Les politiques du Cambodge démocratique ont impacté sur ce système de patronage tel qu'il existait avant la Uh, thank you. Yes, the, uh, I guess there are two, two sides to it. Uh, on the one hand, the existing structures, patronage system, relations, uh, and again, when we talk about relationships and dependency, right, uh, different strings, we're talking about in multiple senses, so we can talk about it on the village level. Right, relationship to the ຫມາຍຄືຫມາຍຄືຫມາຍຄືຫມາຍຄືຫມາຍຄືຫມາຍຄືຫມາຍຄືຫມາຍຄືຫມາຍຄືຫມາຍຄືຫມາຍຄື
Uh, yes, thank you. So, um, for the question with regard to that question, there are a couple of, couple of different layers to it. Um, so you had within different sectors uh, of decay existing quote-unquote strings that existed. Uh, we talked about the Boituan, who was in the northern zone before, uh, we had an extensive patronage network there. So all of the different zones had these networks, relationships of personalized dependency, which were a threat, uh, perceived threat by the uh, decay regime, uh, and, you know, got caught up as there was a perception that there were threats to the regime and these massive purges. Uh, so as purges took place, they would, as I mentioned before, with Rom, they, uh, with uh, Grandmother Yut, where she came in, and systematically they replaced everyone there. Da'an was her superior, though again, at times, uh, the DK regime would put different factions in the same area so that one faction did not get too much power. And so this was another dynamic that existed um, and with regard to, I've heard, uh, and again, uh, in Region 41, they would rotate the people who did the killing at times. There's no, it's not systematic, but the people who were doing the killing uh, on the sub-district level would be rotated periodically in order that they didn't come to know people so much. So there were a number of different systems, but again, the notion that, you know, as you saw when uh, a second cadre, uh, the village had came in uh, in Bong's village and took the 30 names, right, which he was listed on and didn't do anything about it. You can see how those relationships could play a part. And there are other factors where you know, cadre could sometimes protect someone. So if there might be someone with a stigmatized background, the local authorities would have some ability to protect them a tiny bit. And this occurred in other contexts, uh, such as Nazi Germany and different places as well. Je vous remercie. Vous parlez donc ตาโลกยลเคยมีการเตรียมการเตรียมการเตรียมการเตรียมการเตรียมการเตรียมการเตรียมการเตรียมการเตรียมการเตรียมการเตรียมการเตรียมการเตรียมการเตรียมการเต
Ma première question est pourquoi était-il important pour le PCK de détruire cette entité qui était le foyer où la famille Est-ce que vous avez une réponse à la question Uh, yes, I think uh, once again, uh, as with Buddhism, uh, as well as village life, in a sense, these were potential threats to the new regime. There were also uh, alternative sources of loyalty. Uh, but part of what the DK regime wanted to do, if we go back to, for example, Anka, was to take different attachments, emotional attachments that existed, and transfer them from those other sources to the regime, often embodied through the notion of Anka. So Anka would marry couples, children would, you know, different songs that exist, revolutionary songs speak about Anka, how you should have gratitude towards Anka. So again, in this sort of quasi-religious, quasi-spiritual sense of Anka as being the parent, as being the sort of divine being that existed, the people began to forge new relationships with. Uh, so it took on many of the notions of um, uh, personalized dependency, uh, gratitude uh, that existed before that were given to parents and families, that were given to monks, so on and so forth. Those began to be mobilized and reattached to the regime, and this was all part of a broader project of establishing uh, a new society with proper revolutionaries and the young again were looked to, as we've heard before, as blank pieces of paper upon which anything could be inscribed. It was also used and spoken about during the uh, during the DK regime. Um, and the uh, last thing, you know, I should also just mention that, uh, and again, disbanding the family, having people work and sexually se segregate work teams, having children sometimes being kept apart from their parents, uh, and the disbanding of the family, those were all systematic ways to mobilize and, and take this attachment and redirect it towards Anka. Um, many people speak about eating to eat communally, and they very much miss eating together in the family, and that when they would sort of this is mentioned over and over again, it was a source of, I think, great suffering and upset to many people, as was, of course, being, having their family splintered, uh, being under threat, having spies speaking around at night under the houses and listen, uh, and you began to have this generalized atmosphere of distrust that also crept in and could also splinter a family, and I guess, you know, I don't know, to grandmother Yutz being willing to kill her husband or being able to order to have him killed um, is an example of that. Of course, the fragmentation, once again, of that relationship between a parent and a child, uh, but also, as I said before, is linked to mobilization of relationships of personalized dependency. Whether it's from family, from a teacher, from a patron, so on and so forth. Je vous remercie. Vous évoquez dans votre ouvrage, à la page 130, la situation et le rôle des enfants. Et vous évoquez les sessions d'endoctrinement des enfants. Donc vous venez de parler un petit peu. Pouvez-vous nous dire un mot sur la façon dont le, le PCK voyait les enfants et le rôle qu'ils ont joué dans le processus révolutionnaire Yes, thank you. The, um, so again, uh, part of it links to what I, how I was responding before, but I think also this issue speaks back to the notion of revolutionary consciousness, and you have different groups, each individual has a set of tendencies, sort of in essence, whether it's class-based, what have you, uh, and needs to struggle to purify themselves as children since they hadn't grown up in what was formerly a capitalist society were viewed as being more pure, having less regressive tendencies, being able to fashion and forge and sharpen a uh, pure revolutionary consciousness. And so that, for that very reason, the state wanted to take the children, make them child, children of Anka, and they, uh, even more than the people with these regressive tendencies, would be able to lead society to, this, to a beautiful, better future. Uh, thank you very much. 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 Thank you very
vos, vos recherches, vos entretiens, vous ont permis de mesurer l'impact qu'avait eu cet endroit sur les enfants, impact pendant le régime du Cambodge impact à long terme après la chute um, I'm, uh, thank you, Madame, civil party co-lawyer. I'm not sure so by assessment, um, if, in terms of the translation, if the assessment by the document instrument of assessment or my own personal assessment, um, in terms of my own assessment, uh, uh, there are often bonds between families uh, that were shattered or forged in different cases uh, due to the DK regime. Um, you have um, marital agreements that were done by Ankh Aung were brought together with little choice. Uh, one example that I have afterwards is that many of those families had to find a way to continue to live together as opposed to divorcing and the potential stigma that uh, comes with that. Uh, we've had children and some people I've met have never, never told their children that they were married during this period. So we have you know, one legacy of it. Uh, other people have sort of talked about generalized distrust and continued in some sense in the family, some with their uh, but on the other hand, there's also uh, you know, resilience with people, and afterwards people begin to rebuild their lives. Uh, and as they did so, uh, I think into today, many people remember the past. Uh, they still suffer from the past, but they have a resilience, and they've built their lives, and they're moving forward uh, even so. Um, yeah. so Dans votre ouvrage, en introduction, vous expliquez que le peuple nouveau et le peuple de base ont été radicalement affectés de manière différente par les politiques du Cambodge. Vous pouvez vous expliquer quel a été l'impact principal des politiques de ces deux groupes et en quoi ces deux groupes ont été impactés de façon différente. Je vais vous expliquer ce que vous avez dit. Je vais vous expliquer ce que vous avez dit. Je vais vous expliquer ce que vous avez dit. The groups were impacted uh, in different ways. The, the new people uh, were stigmatized in general. They were viewed as having uh, a less sharp revolutionary consciousness, having been suspect because of the environment, the capitalistic environment, and the environment's privatism in which they uh, grew up. Coming from the cities, which were the enemy of the Khmer Rouge for all those different reasons. Uh, so they were stigmatized. I should note that it would be inaccurate, though, to say uh, and I'm not just when you applied this, but I think it's important because sometimes people don't talk about the base people this way. Uh, but base people also suffer a great deal. They die. Anyway, so the base people suffer, though, I think it's clear, for example, in the, in the demographics, the number of people killed, for example, that new people suffered more. Uh, but the base people, and I should note that the people abandoned were base people for the most part. Uh, and as I recount in the book, they suffered in different ways as well. Uh, so I think there was, you know, everybody suffered, but there were certain groups that suffered more, certain groups that were explicitly targeted for destruction. Um, and the base people suffered more, certain groups ក្រោះធ្ងន់ជាងជាជនក្រុមទាំងនេះទេតែខ្ញុំចង់សួរលោកថាតើអឺចំបងទៅលើជាជនទាំងពីក្រុមនេះថាជាជនឥឡូវខ
difficult with categories because they employ diverse ແລະບໍ່ນຶກຄືວ່າຄວາດການປະຈາບໂຕໃຫ້ນັກພະຄະກອດປະຊາຊົນ Merci. Vous parlez dans votre ouvrage du renversement de statut et comment les gens du peuple de base qui étaient des ruraux pauvres généralisés avaient soudainement pris le contrôle sur les riches urbains. Quel a été l'impact de ce renversement de statut pendant la période du Cambodge démocratique et est-ce que ce renversement de statut a laissé des traces dans la société cambodgienne après ហើយតើនៅកេតំណែលដែលនៅសល់ពីការបញ្ជ្រះឋានៈនឹងលោកហូតដល់សព្វថ្ងៃនេះមានអ្វីខ្លះអឺ um, so I tell a story about a teacher that was a teacher who a family that had lived in the area that had gone to Pum Pum City and back and was labeled new people but they had a protector in the current uh, and one of the, one of the uh, cadre uh, who protected them and he was purged yeah, yet, and Rom's forces came in and eventually uh, Rom became upset about what had happened uh, different incidents involved a scarf. But the fa father and the family, so she, one thing was in terms of Kul Bang, uh, or before you mentioned the killing that took place there, uh, her sister was taken and killed there. But their father uh, of this family, as I tell in the book, uh, had a student who he beat and who had a grudge. And the student uh, became a member of the local militia and exacted what was widely perceived as a grudge killing. So I think this is, again, other people could say, well, this person was associated with the old regime, so you had targeting that took place on the local level based on these reversals where people couldn't do anything and had resentment, and they became, got into a position of power, and they were then able to act upon that and target people. So within everything else, if you think about the waves of the killing, uh, you know, you have incitement from above, you have orders that come from above. Uh, you also have people on the local level that take matters into their own hands as well. So you have killings that by and large are being directed from an ideology and a structure of power, but you also have on the local level instances where violence has taken place based on things like, you know, 
begrudgement registered from before, and that's enabled by this reversal of status to go back to the way you framed the question initially. Je vous remercie et les interprètes me demandent de vous demander de parler plus lentement si vous voulez. J'ai encore de plus de questions à vous poser. Je laisserai la place à mon frère Lord Chomki. Vous parlez d'une société égalitaire et je voulais savoir si vos recherches, vos entretiens vous ont permis de tirer des conclusions sur l'égalité réelle ou non entre les hommes et les femmes pendant le Cambodge démocratique. Il reste quelque chose aujourd'hui dans la société cambodgienne de cette égalité proclamée à l'époque entre les hommes et les femmes. Il y a des gens qui ont été mis en place pour les femmes et les femmes. Il y a des gens qui ont été mis en place pour les femmes et les femmes. Il y a des gens qui ont été mis en place. Thank you. Uh, again, the questions open up some more and more sorts of issues, uh, so I apologize for going on uh, a little too long. I think briefly uh, the answer would be that, uh, you know, although, for example, in Cambodia, uh, women have power within the household, and, for example, in terms of running finances. Uh, so there are ways in which women have been historically empowered, empowered and you find this in Southeast Asia in general. But I think that uh, when the Khmer Rouge came in, in one sense they undermined the uh, basis of uh, of gendered power uh, through their the policies, but they the also the empowered the women the through their ideology. I mean, I think the women the had much more of an opportunity to advance, uh, although they didn't really go to the top, very top uh, echelons uh, of the uh, DK government. But the very fact, uh, if we go back uh, uh, to Region 41, uh, Yeo uh, comes in, uh, Ram comes in, uh, a number of female cadre uh, came in when the uh, Southwest cadre uh, arrived uh, in this area. So they were in positions of power. You know, even as we say that, we might note that there was also an attempt to sort of erase the differentiation between men and women. So women would cut their hair very short. Uh, uh, people would dre dress in a similar way. Um, so the sort of gender differentiation in some sense began to level out as well. Uh, and in a way, you can almost look at it as if there was a sort of unisex being that was being created, a pure revolutionary. It could be male or female, but that was insignificant to the very fact of being a pure revolutionary. Um, so the answer is complicated, but I think it's necessary to recognize that there was uh, an intent to bring equality, even if there were many inequalities that came with uh, the Khmer Rouge ideology, uh, and that women in some domains were empowered, even as they were disempowered in others. Je vous remercie. J'ai une, une dernière question. Après la, la famille, je voulais vous poser une dernière question sur, sur l'individu. Dans votre ouvrage, en page 189, vous expliquez la subordination de l'individu à la société, ce dont vous avez déjà parlé depuis le jour, et vous indiquez qu'il y avait une tendance à abandonner le pronom « je » Vous pouvez-vous nous cette tendance et en est que cela a eu un impact sur la société cambodgienne après la partition Après la partition, vous avez vu que Thank you, uh, Madame Civil Party co-lawyer. Yes, the, uh, you know, that's an interesting change that came up. And it's in documents that I, we, that would be spoken with. Um, on, on the one hand, I think it signifies the importance of the collective over the individual. So you speak about we as opposed to, uh, there was a term, for example, the garden of the individual that was used. So you talk about the collective garden versus the garden of the individual. This emphasis on the group as more important 
in uh, taking precedence over the individual. So I think that change reflected that. Uh, the flip side was, again, in terms of individuality, which was reviewed, privatism, which were viewed as regressive qualities. Uh, you know, the sort of individual distinctiveness uh, was muted, and many people as well uh, did not appreciate it. So, uh, you know, in terms of dress, everybody's dressing the same, more or less. Put the clothes, right, attire, people look the same, people cut their hair the same. Uh, and again, it comes back to almost this sort of uniform, generic subject, and I go back to the national emblem sort of epitomizing that. And I think uh, Ritti Pan in his film The Missing Picture as well uh, portrays this through figurines, the bleaching of color, uh, through an artist in an artistic manner, he represents this uh, as well. But, uh, and he talks about the national emblem, but I think, again, this attempt to erase difference, to have a uniform subject. Man, men and women still exist, but it's really a uniform, revolutionary person that's created. This is my last question on this question. Sur cette question précise du, du pronom et de l'abandon en faveur du nous, est-ce que les recherches que vous avez conduites en 1994 ont permis de constater que ce nom persistait dans le village Très ouvert ดูนี้อันนั้นแต่มีปราดได้ได้ฤทธิ์นั้นเป็นได้ขนมตัวสวัสดิ์ชนะมาพร้อมบนบริการสับเป็นเรื่องโลกจับได้มาทุกการศึ
whether it's the, the way, right, the party line, the way of the Buddhist way, right, the path towards enlightenment. So you have the DK party line that has the same sort of term. If you follow the line, you will lead to a better society in the same way that by following the way, the Buddha's way, you'll be led to Nibbana. Uh, so that was one example. Uh, another one was the renunciation idea that I mentioned before, but there are many examples uh, in my book. Uh, so I think I will uh, stop here and uh, thank you very much. ពុទ្ធសាសនិកជនខ្មែរតែតែងតែថ្ងៃសិល <coughs> เอ่อสตรีหรือมวยพลายกรรมนะบ่าจํานวนที่ 4 กรรมจิตใจนั้นมีดอในจํานวนหน้าได้ក្នុងปรามนั้นยกตัวปราได้โลกอาจกอดสมกอลบาน uh, thank you Mr. Uh, civil party uh, co lawyer that's a you know, very good point uh, and you remind me to make one clarification uh, that my argument is not that the Khmer Rouge were Buddhist or that their ideology was Buddhist but that they drew upon Buddhism and you know you pointed out another example uh, the five moral precepts I think the thing that the analog uh, with marriage ideology uh, was Bram the sort of moral precepts that revolutionaries they to follow. Uh, so there's a list of things that each revolutionary qualities, acts they needed to do that weren't the same as those five, but it was the idea of having moral precepts that needed to be followed. Another example, as I sort of think about it, is the notion of mindfulness as a meditation to focus your consciousness. That as well was something that emerged with Khmer Rouge ideology, the idea that you needed to be mindful and focus on the DK party line uh, in everything you did. And so that was another example. Um, so there an attachment as well in terms of cutting yourself off from attachments. That was yet another way, not in terms of desires and attachments. The notion that you need to cut yourself off from attachments was taken and revamped, but linked, for example, to uh, your attachments to your family members. So you needed to be able to cut those off. So there are many, as you're uh, pointing out, many different complicated ways that they sought to do this. Thank you for leading me to that clarification. ទំនាក់ទំនងនេះខ្ញុំចង់សួរមកចំណុចទៀតគឺថាតើការដកនៅក្លឹមសារនៃប្រពុទ្ធសាសនានឹងវាអាចពាក់ព័ន្ធន
ហើយនរិយវិជ្ជានឹងគឺតើទំនាក់ទំនងនរិយវិជ្ជានឹង Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Civil Party uh, co-lawyer, and thank you again for your insight uh, again, into the practices and the, uh, with the, the monks. I appreciate that. It's always good to learn uh, insights from others, and I appreciate your mentioning that, so thank you. Um, with regard to ideology, uh, ideology is some, a word that we use to talk about regimes that tend to have a more uniform set of ideas that are imposed on others. Um, but I think it's important to step back and know as well that, for example, uh, the Khmer Rouge would talk about capitalist ideology. So the word ideology can be used in different ways. In the end, I think of it as structures, ways of thinking that exist in all societies. If we talk about ideology as it's commonly talked about, often it's linked to authoritarian regimes. Uh, as having sort of a more singular message that they impose upon people. Uh, but again, to invoke a term that I mentioned uh, yesterday uh, from a uh, French uh, social philosopher, Louis Althusser, who talks about the oppressive state apparatus, the ideological state apparatus, but he's speaking about communism, about capitalism, although the terms could just as easily be talked about in terms of the DK regime. So again, ideology is a term, in a way it's deployed to characterize movements, uh, and I think about it more as ways of thinking and what motivates people to do the things they do. Um, but you raise a complicated question about what is ideology. Um, we could go into it in more detail if you want, but it's a big, uh, it's a big question. តើការកសាងនៅមនោគមវិជាមួយហ្នឹងដើម្បីឲ្យតាក់ទៀងបែបហ្នឹងso if we uh, speak of the, uh, I understand uh, through the translation of the question, uh, uh, parallels between the DK regime and other forms of ideology that might exist uh, in other countries, uh, so one stream might have been Maoism, uh, Marxist-Leninism, uh, French Stalinist ideology, North Korean models, uh, I think the uh, marriage movement was quite eclectic, even if at root, as they say in the statutes, it's a Marxist Leninist movement, and that's sort of the bottom line. But there were these other influences and parallels with other places that were important, as you point out. <laughs> ចំណុចណាដែលលោកបានសិក្សាអំពីរបបកម្ពុជាវាតាយហ្នឹងการปรับเปลี่ยนตัวให้อดดังคลุนทางทวยเข้าถึงมาก Do you mean uh, in general in society or during DK in particular? ยมสมปดาวเลยบอกกรรมจีบอีกไรอืม 
Thank you, Mr. Civil Party uh, lawyer. Once again, you've touched upon a deep, uh, deep point. Uh, on the one hand, uh, you know, as I said, it's hard to focus on one factor because there are many things involved. And I've spoken before about the need to look at a process. But having said that, uh, maybe another way to reframe the question, and this is something in my second book on Doik uh, that I sort of take up. Um, you know, for me, the lesson of that trial is the danger of what I call, uh, and I apologize to the translators because I'm sure this may not be easy to translate, but what I refer to as effacing conviction, and by this what I mean is that we all believe and have investments in things, we all have belief. When we have belief in something, even if it's a very passionate belief, the danger is that if we have beliefs that lead us to not see another person and the humanity of the other person, right, we efface or erase their humanity. So to me, it suggests, and I, again, I talk about this in the book that's forthcoming, about the importance of another French word, effacement, which is to recognize the humanity of another being. So we all, having conviction is part of what makes us human. Having conviction also has a potential danger in that it can lead us to do things that harm other individual beings. So in our conviction, it's absolutely imperative to recognize the humanity of another person and to have a facing conviction as opposed to effacing conviction. So in the other book, that's how I conclude with this point. Um, having said that, you know, you have the larger, larger, broader processes that are involved, but if I had to crystallize it down, uh, as I think you're saying, sort of the lesson that I got out of much of my studies is the dangers of effacing conviction. Oui, merci, Monsieur le Président. Monsieur l'expert, j'aurais quelques questions de suivi à vous poser, et notamment par rapport à ce que vous avez dit aujourd'hui et hier, quant à cette idée de façonner une conscience révolutionnaire. Est-ce que j'ai bien compris ce que vous avez dit hier si je dis que euh, dans l'idéologie de la rouge, il était possible que toute personne puisse être rééduquée afin d'être façonnée dans cette idéologie afin d'acquérir cette conscience révolutionnaire. Est-ce que ceci était un Thank you, Your Honor. Um, so the quick answer would be yes. I think in the abstract, the principle the answer is yes. Uh, but I think it's important to look at temporality as well, and maybe think of it as what is the greater or lesser likelihood of being able to do this. And as the DK regime proceeded, I think the likelihood of certain groups being able to do so diminished. But again, this goes back to this idea uh, that I mentioned before of cumulative radicalization, where if initially there was a notion that maybe former Khmer Republic officials uh, you know, needed to be eliminated, maybe in part because of the patronage connections, also because they are unlikely to be able to sharpen their consciousness, so to speak. Uh, you know, in the countryside, in many areas, the attacks on people weren't taking place. But over time, as the regime felt threatened, the likelihood of certain groups being able to reform their consciousness, as we say, uh, seems to have diminished, and certain groups seem to have been stigmatized uh, implicitly to the point of saying that 
you know, it's not possible. So if we go back to Muslim John, the, the likelihood of them being able to fashion their consciousness over time was viewed to have diminished, especially after the rebellions that took place. And at that point, they seemed to have been targeted because they were Joms, and Joms as a group. Uh, seemed unlikely to be able to reform their consciousness. Um, I mentioned before with regard to ethnic Vietnamese, uh, I think that that term, there's more of a streak of racism that's there from the very beginning, that's a current that's running. Uh, and I think that especially after tensions, uh, though there is a temporal aspect in the sense that tensions with Vietnam increase, uh, the likelihood that someone who's ethnic Vietnamese could reform their consciousness decreased, though I expect that the sort of pre existing animus that existed towards ethnic Vietnamese uh, had its own sort of strong current that led towards their targeting and elimination. Um, but certainly this then goes to other groups such as, uh, you know, nobody talks about, well, the notion of ethnic Chinese, uh, who, the, as the demographic reports say, died at perhaps 50 percent, uh, seems to be another group that was targeted in part because they came from the cities they were associated with capitalism, uh, but as a group, there is a suggestion that they were being explicitly targeted because the likelihood, again, of their being able to sharpen their consciousness uh, was diminished. If we move to 1978, uh, if we go to the East Zone, when the purges began, and these purges were distinct because, well, many people died everywhere, but when we got to the East Zone, we had large-scale purges that went beyond the sort of purges that had been taken elsewhere, and large numbers of the population began to be targeted, and it's possible, again, so the likelihood of this group being able to sharpen their consciousness, so to speak, seems to have been much diminished, uh, and I think you could argue that the East Zone, the people who were targeted were part of a national group, with that part going back to the UN Genocide Convention. Uh, the term you know, national group is one that's somewhat hard to find. It's defined, it's debated, but I think within the terms of the convention, that's a possibility to look at the purge of the East Zone group and the people who were targeted, uh, as well as genocide. Um, so the question you raise, the answer is yes, if you look at ideological pronouncements. But over time, it changes in different groups, the likelihood increases or diminishes. Je voudrais revenir brièvement sur ce que vous avez dit par rapport au Cham. Vous avez dit qu'il y a eu une évolution et que, euh, au fur et à mesure du temps qui est passé, le groupe des Cham, en tant que tel, a été perçu comme étant incapable de se façonner à la conscience révolutionnaire. Alors, est-ce que vous pouvez nous dire... Euh, vous avez dit que c'était à cause de la rébellion. Mais est-ce qu'il y a d'autres facteurs qui ont pu jouer Je pense notamment à la religion, puisque les chams, la majorité des chams, sont de religion musulmane. Est-ce que la religion musulmane a été un des facteurs qui était pris en compte comme ou ne permettant pas cette prise de conscience révolutionnaire Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, yes, I did, I did not mean to imply that it was solely because of the rebellions that they were targeted. Uh, if we return to the notion of the crystallization of difference, people were clearly in Cambodia aware of the differences between the identity differences of Cham and ethnic Khmer. So that awareness pre-existed DK. When you had the rebellions, those differences became more accentuated, um, I guess, uh, as well with the question uh, that was asked by uh, the civil party co-lead lawyer, um, as well that sort of plays into this about men and women at the same thing. The idea is you have a uniform revolutionary person with a pure consciousness. That vision does not afford, is not as open to a notion of ethnic difference. And I think as well, if you look at policies, for example, in former uh, Soviet states as well, the different republics, you had this playing out uh, the former Yugoslavia as a dynamic as well. But you had people, if you can't fashion yourself into the proper revolutionary being, for whatever reason, you become suspect, you become a target. 
and groups that are identified who have practices that are viewed as privativism, as regressive, as not conforming to that uniformity that's being sought, then become targets. So absolutely religion and religious practices play into it because those don't accord with revolutionary ideals. But again, you know, the, the, so there were things that were taking pl place before 1975, but I think the rebellions themselves contributed to this process of cumulative radicalization by which they increasingly became targeted. And then, as I've talked about, uh, as the one example linked to my research uh, that shows in Kampong Siam district where all the Cham were taken away, by that time they had become targets and there were orders that came down targeting them. So the answer, it's a long response to the question to say, yes, religion is absolutely important, as are the rebellions. They come together as a number of factors that lead to them to be viewed as a counter-revolutionary suspect group. Donc, si la, révolution, si la religion est, est, est importante, c'est parce qu'elle permet d'identifier les Cham comme étant possiblement contre-révolutionnaires. Yeah, the, thank you, Your Honor. The Jams uh, would qualify as a religious group. Um, we're trying to define them as well as being an ethnic group, I think. Um, you know, the UN Genocide Convention, as I'm sure you're aware, in different cases, sometimes because these categories are translated categories, the categories that emerge through a discussion uh, prior to the passing of the, uh, of the convention uh, were never fully defined. And so if you go to different localities, if you do Hutu and Tutsi, for example, sometimes it's hard to pin down exactly what a group is. But I think the Jams themselves clearly fall within religious as a categorization and were targeted in part because of their religious beliefs which didn't accord with DK ideology, the notion of the uniform citizen, the pure revolutionary uh, that needed to be forged, uh, and were targeted because of that, uh, because of their customs, because they rebelled, uh, because they had a different language, because they dressed differently. Uh, a number of those other categories that anthropologists call ethnic markers as well. Alors, si j'ai bien compris ici ce que vous avez dit, vous avez dit qu'en ce qui concerne le, le groupe des Vietnamiens, les choses étaient un peu différentes, puisqu'il y avait une approche beaucoup plus raciste à l'égard des Vietnamiens. Est-ce qu'on peut dire que, dès le départ, il était considéré que les, les Vietnamiens ne pouvaient jamais être éduqués Est-ce que c'est -ce est quelque chose qui est ressorti de vos recherches Oui, c'est un peu ça. Euh, en fait, with ethnic Vietnamese, and you also, in parallel with that, had the deteriorating relationships that were going on with Vietnam. So the beginning of, if you look at the animosity towards ethnic Vietnamese, that seems to have been much more pronounced at the beginning of DK and came on somewhat later with ethnic Jam. 
So if you had to map it out, right, the trajectories would be slightly different, even if you end up with the same thing, which is the mass elimination of members of both groups and disproportionately high numbers in terms of the demographics. But again, ethnic Vietnamese, the figures appear to be 100 percent. Joms, well, I won't get into the debate about numbers, but there's a, there's a significant number and a higher number that may range from, I think it's 36 or 37 percent to much higher, depending on if uh, uh, Mr. Osman's figures are correct, but I know you'll be debating that in the future. J'aurais une dernière question à vous poser en lien avec ce que vous avez dit par rapport à, à la déshumanisation. Le titre de votre livre, c'est « Pourquoi ont-ils tué ?» Et c'est vrai que dans votre livre, on voit parfois des, des décrits ອັນປີຊຸດຊາຈະກະມອງອັນປີຊຸດຊາຈະກະມອງອັນປີຊຸດຊາຈະກະມອງອັນປີຊຸດຊາຈະກະມອງອັນປີຊຸດຊາຈ
the defendants in this case as well that there would be sort of dehumanizing, reductive ways of characterizing them. And I, it's important for all of us to look at the humanity of people who participate in these projects. Um, and so that, that's a long answer to why I go into detail about this one case to talk about the moral and the structures of meaning that informed action in this case. Uh, and we always need to be attuned to that. And again, it goes back to this notion of of facing conviction as opposed to effacing conviction. Quand on examine ce qui s'est passé, ce que vous avez décrit, euh, est-ce que on peut dire que les, 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 ceux qui ont exécuté sont allés au-delà de ce qui leur était véritablement demandé. Et si oui, pourquoi Yes, thank you. This is, you know, in terms of connecting down to the local level, um, how do we understand it? So the quick answer is yes, they go beyond uh, because all human beings and what they do create meaning. They draw upon the structures of understanding that they have to carry out acts. Uh, this goes back to what anthropology is and culture as the schemes that lead us to think and act in different sorts of ways. And so again, for me as an anthropologist, what's of interest is to try and understand how an act like human liver eating can take place. And the type of research is talking to people to find out the local understandings of this act, uh, and then I, I present those. Um, so the quick answer is uh, yes, they exceed orders. But again, you have to, one has to keep in mind that there is a broader dissemination of an ideology, and there are orders that go down targeting certain groups. So it's not as if those actions are completely disentangled from the larger ideology and structure, command structure that exists. They can be linked, even as the people on the ground understand them, as opposed to simply saying they follow orders to understand the meaning of what they do. Je vous remercie, Monsieur l'expert. Je n'aurai pas de questions à poser. Ah, ok, ok. Le gouvernement a déjà dit qu'il y avait une démarche. On peut pas faire ça. Ça peut pas être possible. On peut pas faire ça. 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 On peut